Uh, good morning, and thanks for having me. Um, so uh, as Paul said, uh, my name is Anthony, and I am the Associate Director of uh, Intel's Research Lab uh, in Seattle. And uh, what we focus on uh, in our lab is uh, the area of ubiquitous computing, which um, I suspected I was going to have to explain to, to most of the people. But after having had one-on-ones this morning, um, I, I think you're all pretty far down this road. But I'm specifically going to talk about um, how we've been using it uh, in the space of health and wellness. So. Uh, hmm. I'm not getting any love here. Right. No, Oh, there we go. Page swapping. So, uh, so I'm going to tell you just a tad about um, Intel Research and, and our lab in Seattle because it's a little different than than most industrial labs. And then uh, I'm really going to spend most of the time talking about. Um, research artifacts uh, we've developed um, coming up from um, some novel ways of sensing and, and integrating sensors into platforms through uh, some sense making, so actually you know, inferring things about the environment with the data collected from those sensors, up through what I think is really the most important part of our mission, coming up with um, you know, high value applications that we can use uh, this type of technology for um, that, that are within reach. And then of course, uh, you know, we are a research lab, so we've got um, lots of challenges, um, which, I'll, which I'll finish up with. Um, so, uh, so our lab is in Seattle. Um, we were founded as one of four uh, open research um, lablets um, with Intel. Uh, there's one here in Berkeley, one in Carnegie Mellon, there was one in Cambridge, um, and ours in Seattle. Um, each are staffed with around 15 researchers, but because we work uh, with an open collaborative research model where students come and you know, you know, they don't sign NDAs when, when they come for an internship, you know, our hope is that they actually go back and, and do their thesis on what they were working on so we continue to work together. We actually usually, between the interns and people they're visiting uh, on sabbaticals or, or, or on contract, um, ooh, that's fabulous, uh, we usually actually have a community of around 30. But this is going to give you a sense for the size of our lab and the, and the, the Berkeley lab um, and the Pittsburgh lab. And, and the focus of our lab is on ubiquitous computing, which which I like to define, unfortunately, uh, in terms of what it's not, which is you know computing off the desktop, um, you know non-traditional uh, in the environment, embedded in objects, embedded in spaces, um, to try to solve um, new types of problems um, for users. And we're really trying to look at use cases that simplify and enrich people's lives. Uh, so this fits in uh, really well with the vision for our for our parent organization, Intel Research, which has identified um, five themes for their computing, which, which are they're wrapping up into um, an area uh, uh, they're calling essential computing, which has a similar goal around um, simplifying and enriching um, you know, work and work in everyday life. And of course, you know, my, my, my title slide had, had health applications on it. And I actually haven't said anything about health yet. And the truth is we actually have, have no health experts um, at all in our lab. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, it's a fabulous application domain because you know, what else is higher value? What else is more about? Enriching and, and the truth is it slices across all of this and advances in any of these um, potentially make uh, computer support for health and wellness um, uh, more valuable. So uh, just in case um, you know you've been you know out hiking hiking for a year or you're really caught up in the, the latest 24 and, and you blinked, um, you might have missed a, a real um, technology uh, innovation here um, that, that a whole bunch of things that were sort of merrily marching along, making your PC faster and your laptop lighter, actually created a new kind of platform. And, you know, anybody who's been working with Berkeley Notes, uh, you know, just can go to sleep for a second. Um, but you know, the, the advent of ad hoc wireless networking, you know, the fact that you can get you know, TransFlash now the size of a little chip of paint that has gigabytes of, of solid state storage on it, um, the, the, the very power efficient um, microprocessors and microcontrollers they're making today, and just this absolute renaissance in the sensor space that you know, for, for, for a penny or two or six, you can actually get you know, dozens of different kinds of sensors that sense you know, all kinds of things from, from vibration and light and you know, you know, gas sensors and radiation sensors, that, that now there's really this, um, this new platform, the sensor platform, that's it's small, it's cheap, it's um, mobile, uh, and, and it's very easily deployed. And this really, uh, these are the building blocks that that our lab is, is working with and, 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 and integrating into our solutions. And uh, I think it's here, really, that there's going to be um, uh, you know, a huge push in the future. So, so you know, this is an example of, of a Berkeley dot moat, which I'm sure, sure lots of people have, have worked with. But you know, this has an 8-bit uh, microprocessor on it, you know, very tiny. If you, if you duty cycle carefully with a little lithium-ion battery, you can do things for years with it. Um, 
this is a, this is a slightly larger device, which I'm going to talk about later. But this is our um, our mobile sensing platform. Um, we crammed about 12 sensors into, into it, not not because they were the 12 best, but because they were just the 12 easiest, so we could experiment with it. Now this actually has a 400 megahertz uh, strong arm processor in it. So sort of you know imagine what your PC had a few years ago. So capable of doing some pretty heavyweight embedded inference. Um, and this is really the, the the class of the class of things that you know this is where we're starting from, and it, and it, and it should really only get better. Uh, so so here's a picture of um, of the health related um, projects that, that that we've had in our lab, and I, and I've stratified it here, um, ranging up from from sensing and. I should clarify that you know uh, we like to talk about sensing uh, as, as dense sensing. So so you know the typical approach has been let's put let's put um, a pretty powerful sensor, but maybe one or two of them in the corner of rooms. Let's put a couple cameras and see what we can actually um, do with that. Or or let's put a motion sensor and try to track people um, through a house. And and we're really looking at um, lots of sensors. Let's put a sensor in in every object that costs more than a dollar. Let's let let's put let's put you know. You know, temperature sensors. You know, in every device, on every person, um, and 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 you're going to see that um, consistent across across our approach. Um, we've got results in sense making. Actually, our lab has um, three or four uh, people who really just focus on um, machine learning and machine inference, and and they've been um, working with with lots of sensor data. And then finally, sort of my favorite part are are the the health and wellness applications we're using to to try to improve the value of uh, of these new technologies. So. Um, uh, it, it makes more sense rather than to, to talk about uh, any of these individually to kind of take a take a slice through them um, in the in the context of a larger umbrella project. And uh, the first one of those I'm going to tell you about is um, technologies for long-term care, or TLC, the, the project PI. So I actually have little breadcrumbs on all these slides. I figure I, there's so much to go through. The best I'm going to do is get you uh, interested to go read more or look in this. So so. Um, I've put who the research lead for these various efforts are in the bottom right, and if there isn't one, then it's the lead for the for the whole project. And in the upper left, I've sort of tagged, you know, whether I'm actually talking about this sensing level, the sense making, or, or or the application level. Too much time with PowerPoint. Um, so the, so the goal of this project, or at least one aspect of the goal, is to uh, recognize um, activities of daily living. I can tell you what that is um, for long-term care management. So this is for people that need in-home care um, or um, potentially need. Uh, uh, you know, transitioning into an assisted living facility, and activities of daily living is a is, is a, like a real medical term, and this is refers to uh, the things that you do every day that that you take for granted: getting dressed, brushing your teeth, being able to use the toilet, being able to, you know, uh, prepare your own food, and um, it's actually uh, quite an important part of um, of medical care, and it's a it's a real. Um, Key thing that they look at um, in terms of uh, decline in conditions that involve um, dementia or, uh, you know, or you know things like things like Alzheimer, um, and it's 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 very critical. I mean, lots of insurance companies and states actually require that an ADL form be filled in every day or every week or every month. Um, case workers, uh, like in the state of Washington, do ADL assessments to figure out how well you can do things, and based on that, they actually set your benefit levels. Um, and and unfortunately, it's it's time intensive. People have to you know go in the home and actually observe people and watch them and check how they're dressed. And um, it, you know it's obviously intrusive to the people um, being cared for. And because it happens um, you know seldom, you know even 15 minutes a day isn't that that long to, to watch someone. Um, it's not necessarily um, all that accurate. And so the opportunity here is to say, well, gee, could we make a system for um, for automating the monitoring of ADL? So this is an example of uh, uh, we were working with a caseworker, and they had a little short, small ADL form that they would fill out every day when they visited with someone. And this is just sort of like saying, well, it, you know, electronically, this is what it could look like. And if the system um, produced this and pulling up to the to the person's house, you know, the nurse actually had had a device that actually sort of had this data on it. It would give them, um, you know, maybe three steps down the road before they um, before they even open the door. Um, so now you're gonna you're gonna see probably across um, across all the things that we're that. Um, that our lab is working on it. We're really not medical experts. We don't. Um, we don't. Uh, you know, I'm not going to show you anything that's using physiological sensors. No embedded blood glucose um, type deal. And um, we're really focusing on the lifestyle sensors, the things that are really 
you're a doctor, the first thing you're going to care about is, you know, what's the person's whatever, whatever levels in their blood. Um, the next thing you might care about then is, um, you know, are they active? Are they getting out? Are they changing their, their, their daily routines and their patterns? And, and that's actually where we're focusing. Um, because, you know, Intel has other people that are, that are, that are looking, at that, looking at that first problem. So <clears throat> uh, before we actually decided to try to, you know, build a system to see if we could actually figure out um, these activities of daily living uh, automatically, um, we did a little uh, formative work to try to figure out where the value of, of such a technology um, could be applied. So, so clearly, it um, has the potential to be time savings for the professional care providers. And if it does it, it does its job well, it's going to increase quality of life and quality of care for the elders. But uh, it turns out there's actually a large network of people um, that wind up um, caring for someone who, who needs assistance. Uh, and so we actually started, believe it or not, with studying what the technology, how we would actually um, use the data that was collected before figuring out how to actually collect the data. So, um, uh, so, so this is a picture in the upper right of of. Uh, someone's care network, in this case, someone we called Rita. And the, um, and, and, and the circles are all of the people that actually aren't medical pr practitioners, but um, friends and family that actually care for this person. And, and there's, a, there, there's a few dimensions encoded in this picture. You know, the, the distance from Rita is, is the distance they physically lived from her, and, and the size of the circle is the, 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 the size of the role they played. So the small dots were sort of peripherally involved people. Um, and so our study was actually um, to take uh, the data that, that, that would have been collected from an activities of daily living um, system, like did they take their meds, are they eating, are they getting out of the house, are they visiting, did they get up and around today, and actually put it in a display. So we've got, you know, we've got um, the elder's picture, but, but circling the picture are actually the, um, are actually the status on their daily ADLs um, flagging issues that could potentially be drilled down into. And we put these displays actually in the homes um, of, of the people in the care network. So we actually let you know, the, the adult children actually have these displays so they could actually, um, uh, so they could actually monitor the progress. The, the data that they were shown was customized by, by the elder with respect to who they were allow allowing to see what types of data, so, so they weren't all the same. Um, and we did Wizard of Oz with the data collection. So we actually just called the elder, uh, I think it was four or six times a day, and actually said, what did you have for breakfast? Did you take your human in? Um, and we use that to basically push that data to the to the display. So from the consumer's perspective, the data was absolutely um, was you know was absolutely right. From, from the elders' perspective, the, the the experience was they were sort of behind the curtains with us. So we actually deployed these in four care networks, four people's worth of um, care providers um, for three weeks. And uh, what was interesting was we we did see um, you know large value actually e even beyond um, even beyond the person being cared for. So. So the drastic life changer, the big green dot, are the people that, um, you know, they, they've, they've changed career, they've potentially given up, um, you know, m moving away and, and, and following their dream type thing to take care of this person. And, and, and their benefits were, uh, you know, th that they, they reported feeling more relaxed because they were no longer the, the lifeline, they weren't the, the center hub that everything had to flow through. Um, Another interesting one is they actually got information without having to ask demeaning questions. So, so the display sort of um, you know, depersonalized um, having, to, having to ask those probing questions. But I think my favorite is the significant contributors, the people in blue who, um, who, who reported actually that they actually thought they were the green dots and they didn't realize that there were other people doing more work. And that, that awareness peripherally of what other people were doing actually um, uh, helped them put, put their own efforts in perspective. Um, and then the periphery invo peripherally involved, these are the people that sort of, you know, you know I don't know the frequency, but you know, every other week or once a month type, they actually found that they, they were communicating more because they actually had conversation starters. They actually saw what the elder was doing and maybe who was visiting, and they actually, you know, they could call up and say, oh, you got out to the senior center today, that's great, and because, they, you know, reduce some of that social friction. And then we had actually some very interesting examples w um, where the elders uh, reported that because more people had data, you know, diagnosis became more distributed. Um, and, and, and they, they experienced improved, improved care. There's actually quite a bit in this project about privacy, which, which I didn't talk about. Um, I want to say that um, <clears throat> actually managing privacy is a central theme that, that, that's actually run through, um, through our lab and our projects. Um, we have a, a, a strong focus on um, putting the technology into the client, you know, embed the sensing, embed the inference so that um, the devices can choose to disclose if they like, as opposed to um, having smart infrastructure that senses and then lets the people know what, what they could potentially tell everyone else. Um, 
So, so, so this provides, you know, for us, I mean, you know, c coming off of this 2004 study, you know, we were, we were extremely um, jazzed about, about, um, about trying to actually do this, this, this ADL uh, inference automatically. And, and of course, the problem is that it's, that it's really hard because, you know, it involves the physical world. Um, it involves lots of different kinds of activity. I mean, we're not talking about just instrumenting, you know, a smart lab bench. We're talking about if you want to measure washing up, you got to instrument the sink. If you want to measure, um, you know, cooking type tasks, you have to monitor um, the appliances. And um, while there is research in monitoring specific activities, and I have a little data on this later, they all really kind of have different sensors. Um, and those sensors wind up with different um, feature extractors, different classifiers. And so while there are stoved pipe solutions for um, particular ADLs, um, there's no sort of general solution, one size fits all. Um, so, so, so the key insight uh, for our approach to this problem came from um, you know, like these screenshots from, from those cheesy uh, Invisible Man movies from the 50s. Um, and the observation is that, gee, you know, if you were in your kitchen and there was an Invisible Man, or one, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell, um, in your kitchen making breakfast, you know, you can't see this person at all. So you can sense, you know, nothing about this person. But, you know, if you see them go to the fridge and then you see the eggs trot out and then you see, you know, a whisk and, a, and, and the cheese and a bowl and then the pan, you know, you'll very quickly figure out this person's making an omelet, even though you actually can't see um, the individual at all. And, and, and the observation here that um, for many domains, the objects you interact with um, uh, are a really good proxy for what you're actually doing, what your activity is. Um, and, and fortunately, um, we actually do have a reasonable um, way to uh, give objects proxies in the virtual world, and that's, and that's RFID. So, you know, the same tags that, um, that, you know, they're talking about putting in all the euro bills, the same thing you can go to the, the vet and get, get embedded in your pet. Um, there, you can buy, you know, cheap RFID tags. I mean, they were 40 cents when we made this slide, you know, a year or two ago, they may be less. They come in sticker form. They've got ones that are dishwasher safe. Obviously, they have ones that are uh, pet implantable safe. And while, you know, while, while that RFID tag doesn't know that it's on a toothbrush, you can take its 96-bit ID, and if you associate a database with a toothbrush, then an RFID reader could be, um, you know, could could be able to detect that in fact, you know, the laser pointer um, is what this device is. Now, of course, the trick is that. We want to um, monitor people interacting with objects. And RFID readers are typically um, things that are implanted in um, you know, uh, you know, doorways where pallets go through or, or you know, in, in, in a UPS distribution center. Um, but, but there was actually nothing inherent about that. And, and uh, while the tags were usually mobile, there was no reason the, the, the readers couldn't also be mobile. And this is where um, you know, these, these, these fabulous small um, platforms come in. So, so we took um, one of the one of the Berkeley dot moats, and we built a small custom RFID reader um, implementing you know, an industry standard so we could just buy the tags off the shelf. Um, RFID circuit, uh, and, and with, with, with an antenna in a bracelet, um, we get about a 10 to 12 inch range. So when you have this on, you actually have sort of this 10, 12 inch you know, invisible glove around your hand. And the reader reads once a second, and it can actually you know, very reliably tell that, you know, which objects you're interacting with. Assuming you pick it up with the hand, you have the you you, you have the bracelet on, um, and and from a from a charge perspective, because we're only waking it up and and, and, and pinging once a second, um, whether you whether you store the data on the bracelet or transmit it off to, to the central system, we get about a, a week's worth of charge. So we're not talking about um, an odious charging task. And I know probably a lot of you in the back of your mind are saying, I would never wear that thing, and and, and you're, you're probably right. And we actually are are, um, are doing a revision of the design, which should be. You know, much, much, much smaller with a flexible, with a flexible antenna. Um, but, uh, but, but as prototypes go, believe it or not, we've actually had some companies say, no, 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 that's okay. We could actually use that the way it is right now. You know, given how how, how clunky some of the other stuff is. Um, so, so one of the nice things um, about um, using as the as the raw um, input into the system, really just nouns. Um, is that it actually makes the um, classification and activity modeling simple. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about, um, you know, vision, keyframe, uh, you know, complicated techniques here. I mean, here we actually have, um, uh, this I believe is the, is the real model that we use for, um, or, or a, you know, not far off from it, for, um, for making T. And this really is just a probabilistic model saying, well, you know, T's got three stages, and, you know, during the first stage with, with these likelihoods, 
um, you're going to see those kinds of nouns, right? You might make it in the microwave. So I mean, I, I cannot imagine that uh, um, you know, in my house, th th this model would have would have the microwave oven. But you know, at some point, there's going to be a cup, and there's going to be some tea involved, maybe in a tea bag. And then at the end, there might be some milk or sugar. And we're not going for you know for perfect here, but if you actually see any combination of these objects, it's going to look a lot more to the system like making tea than you know sharpening a lawnmower blade. Um, <laughs> And uh, the other fabulous thing about this is that um, the models are actually um, reasonably easy to build. You know, saying um, you know, that tea is composed of basically, making tea is composed of working with these particular objects, well, that's, that's, that's really common sense. And common sense has actually um, been reasonably well captured uh, uh, on websites like ehow.com. So you, know, you can go to ehow, and they have like 50,000 activities on how to make a peanut butter sandwich, you know, how to throw a good party, how to, how to make tea. Um, and, uh, so, and, and we've experimented with a technique to just, uh, just literally go out there, take the page, grab all the nouns, take them in order, um, and build a simple model out of it. Sure, it's not going to be quite right, and you'll wind up with combinations of things um, mixed that probably shouldn't. But, but, but probabilistically, it's still going to look a lot more like, uh, like the activity is representing than, than the other ones. So this is a little, um, so, so, so we mined 40,000 activities. This is you know, vastly more than most systems where you're actually hand building each of the, these activities. Um, usually by grad students. Um, and, and this is a total miss. This is five weeks was not five weeks of crunching. This is just because we were only allowed to hit Google 100,000 times a day before they turned off the, the particular account we had. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so to do a test for how this worked, we um, took, uh, I will confess, one of the researchers home. And we, we tagged about 100 objects in his house. And then um, we defined 65. Uh, activities of daily living, 65 ADLs, and we randomly assigned some people um, into in, into a, into um, a little group that had had 12 of those, and then we said, you know, go off and do these 12 activities in some arbitrary order, uh, and then and then let, let, let's measure them and sort of see how well it works. So people got a card like this, kind of saying, you know, in the bathroom there's these types of things, go off and do some dental hygiene. Um, and 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 these are are the high level results, and so the couple things that, that I want to point out. Are um, so the first was that I had alluded to the fact that um, no, I'd explicitly said that you know th there had been systems in the past for for learning or or observing um, particular ADLs, and that's what these green dots are. So you know we went in, in in the literature and we found you know there may be more now, but you know we found a study of medication taking. We found a you know a study on the use of heating in the home. One one on toileting, not my first choice. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe this is the grad student effect, but we found three systems for, for, for um, monitoring snack making. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of hit and miss, and nothing, has, um, no, nothing has, has gone across all of these. And our system, this is, this is accuracy in this column. And this is accuracy in terms of precision and recall, which machine learning people just love that. They don't like to give a single accuracy number. But, but, but more or less, the upshot is um, it works reasonably well. And again, um, as a baseline here, we're not, you know, we're not putting a man on the moon with this technology. We're, comparing this to a baseline of how well does this system work versus having a home care provider come in 15 minutes three times a week. Um, so the, you know, the, the accuracies of, of, of the current state of the art are actually very, very, very poor. Um, and so, so from that perspective, this was very encouraging. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, it's, it was a left hand, right hand thing. It was that pe pe people typically do, lo did do lots of manipulation with, with their dominant hand, but, but phone was one that they didn't. And so, uh, yeah, I think that was a. So, um, so probably the biggest problem you know, I personally have um, with this project, which I was uh, you know, mercilessly beating up the researchers on, was this is all great, but I don't want to wear a bracelet. I don't want to be tagged. I don't want to feel like you know, uh, you know, a bird on one of those little sanctuary islands. Um, plus, what happens if I, you know, s sneaking down every night at midnight for a midnight snack? I mean, there may actually be some, you know, very um, non-independently random data that, that, that you're not collecting um, that, that's going to that's gonna really throw off um, the system's perception of me. Um, and so uh, how could you um, detect interaction with objects um, from a distance without instrumenting the user? And it turns out there are also, um, you know, conditions uh, like Alzheimer in particular where people don't, you know, they, they just will not tolerate wearing anything. So smart tags, they just take them off and drop them. They just don't. In fact, it is a terrible story about you know it's not terrible but um, you know the, 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 they have to actually when they do monitoring of, of dementia patients sometimes they have to actually trick them so you give them a big hug in the morning and then you, you you clip the smart tag and then by the end of the day they've usually found it and taken it off but then you repeat the thing in the morning um, 
So, uh, so we have a, had a researcher in our lab. Um, Josh Smith is a brilliant guy. Definitely um, wins the White Lab Coat Award um, for our lab. Who um, who had the observation that uh, that if you think about an RFID tag, um, it's batteryless. You can take the thing, you can implant it inside of you know something plastic. You can you can embed it in a device and um, the, the way it works is that it's actually excited by the RFID reader. The, the, the RFID reader shoots out some energy, and the tag has, um, has uh, a little coil in it, and it harvests just enough energy to, to power up a radio and send back its 96 bits. Um, and, and his observation was, gee, you know, sending that 96 bits, relatively speaking, is a pretty heavyweight thing. I mean, it's actually just you know, it's charging up a radio. And you know, we should actually be able to use some of that to drive a really low power microcontroller. And some of these sensors that we're actually using are extremely low power. So rather than having um, an RFID tag just be um, a dumb thing that just communicates one packet, why not have it do a little bit of computing and a little bit of sensing, and then communicate that same packet, but embedded with some actual sensor data? Um, so there are, there, are, there are two kinds of um, RFID tags. There, there are ones that are made for short-term readers and long-term readers. So, um, so he built from scratch um, a, a long-range tag that actually um, had this property that it was capable of being, you know, more or less a, a full-blown computing system that um, worked entirely using energy that was harvested from um, harvested from the RFID reader. And the beauty here now is that there's no, there's no wearables required. So, um, so I have a video of this, and of course the thing he's showing off is ridiculously large because you know it's made with you know Radio Shack wire and and it's covered with hot glue. I mean, it's the sort of thing that there's no reason to think this couldn't be made, um, you know, the same size. Um, uh, you know, as a normal um, long-range RFID tag, but um, this video um, shows uh, shows the tag in this case outfit with um, a 3D accelerometer. So, dun -dun -dun. so, um, so what Josh is doing is he's actually holding the Wisp, and there's a long-range RFID reader. It was actually in a in a picture frame that's sitting off to the side, and. Um, so, so what he's doing is, he, is he's tipping this WISP, which is you know, a, a batteryless component. And you can't say it's passive, because it's actually doing computing. Um, and, and the RFID reads, by the way, this is completely standard with um, the RFID protocol. So it's speaking the regular protocol. It just happens to be encoding in, say, the high 40 bits, the, the, the acceleration data, um, back to the reader. And then when the reader reports the, the tags that it's seeing, um, he's, you know, he's rendering Saturn to actually match that. Um, but this is a way that we could, you know, potentially instrument objects and tell their temperature, tell whether they're being tipped. So now we know that not only did someone interact with the glass, but we also know, you know, whether they're really drinking from it or they're simply moving it around, what the temperature of it is. Now, interestingly, is you actually lose the, the you actually, th this is anonymous, you actually lose the personalization. So now, um, whereas the bracelets were in fact personal and you can tell, you know, grandma made a snack instead of grandpa, now you actually know that a snack was made. Um, but but we see this as a as a as a key technology. Obviously, this is this is pretty um, pretty um, cutting edge. So we actually um, are not considering um, using Wisps in any of our near term deployments because we we literally have a handful of these. Um, so this is the current yeah. Uh, what was the RF I don't know. These are these are off the shelf Gen One um, alien readers. I don't actually know, but I mean it, it's it's standard, you know, RFID. If they have lots of frequencies, Josh would be the one to ask um, that particular question too. So, so the current status of the project is um, it, it, this is a you know, fairly mature research project where we really want to show that this ADL recognition can work in a long-term care setting, um, and that it potentially can reduce care burden. So, um, so we've managed to attract. Um, the state of Washington is a partner, actually, to to because uh, they're extremely interested in this, um, you know, in, in the outcome of technology like this. So we're going to be doing um, uh, two deployments um, this year: a 20-person deployment, and next year a 50-person deployment, um, w with the goal of really trying to, um, you know, quantify the value of this. And and so this is a 12-person effort um, being done across Intel, um, the University of Washington, and Washington State of Aging and, and Disability Services. So, um, so now I'm going to switch gears to um, a uh, slightly uh, newer project. And um, this one is called Sensing Modeling and Supporting Everyday Behavior. And the goal of this is to um, try to make it so that uh, there are you know, very few barriers from a usability, from a user understanding, from a privacy, um, adoption of the use of behavioral monitoring in naturalistic environments. So you're sort of out around and have your computing. Um, sensing your context, sensing your environment, and, and using it on your behalf to, to, to achieve those goals. So, so this is sort of the, the slice of the technologies 
um, that we're going to go through. And, and we're actually starting with, you know, if we go back to that um, invisible person in your house, if they're doing something just straight up physical, whether they're uh, you know, sitting on your couch like a sluggard or, or, or they're, they're doing sit-ups or push-ups, you actually can't tell that. So there are obviously human activities we engage in that don't involve objects. Uh, and this was our attempt to try to measure um, data from, from that realm. So this is a, this is a, um, a sensor platform that we developed. Um, it has 10 sensors uh, ranging from you know, accelerometers, temperature, barometer. We included a bunch of extra ports, so serial ports for connecting to high-level things, GPIO pins for connecting low-level analog sensors, just because we want to just use this as an experimentation platform. The idea, obviously, is that once we get a ways down the road, then we build a custom device for a domain and say, well, really, these are the three key sensors, so we can make it much smaller. Uh, and much cheaper. But, but we explicitly put a, a beefy processor on this and a lot of storage so that we could do onboard inference and actually figure out what's going on. And because we intend for this to be something we share with our collaborators, we've um, got a, a quite a nice development environment as well where we, you know, we have a Linux virtual uh, VMware image that, that, you, that you can download. You know, it's a gigabyte and a half, but it's got everything already configured with the cross compilers. You just you just plug it in and, and you just program it. The, the person that did this did, did an excellent job. So it's a very very usable platform, and um, this is something that that you know we're doing another run of to, to make available to to our collaborators whom we're working with. Um, so so th this is the, the the sort of data that we that we get from the MSP. Um, so you know, this is this is someone you know walking upstairs, taking an elevator, walking down. So this is really the the, the type of data you know, unlike the the RFID reads, where we're getting you know in that case very concrete, um, you know, high level objects. Here we're actually talking about low level low level sensor data. Uh, so so a big question um, for us, and and it was like deja vu this morning talking with um, you know some of the students here who are working you know in a very similar space. How well can you actually use this sort of data from things like accelerometers and and, and digital compasses and barometers to actually infer uh, everyday physical activities. Uh, it, it, it's been well understood, honestly, that if you take the sensors and you push them out to, push them out to the extremities. So you know, like the, the the Nike thing in the shoe. You know, if you instrument rings and shoes and gloves and wristbands, it's actually quite easy because you're seeing lots of this. But if you centralize it and make it easy to use, you you, you build it into a cell phone, you put it into a belt buckle, you put it on somebody's shoulder strap of their backpack. Um, it gets much harder because you're only getting data from, from one place. You're not getting relative sensor movements. Um, so, so this was the goal. Take the sensor package, put it together, collect some data. Um, from a sense-making perspective, I mean, I if you're interested, this is the lead, and you can go off and read the papers. They were using uh, boosted decision stumps, which is something not, you know, not unlike the, the neural nets that, that the people um, here are, are experimenting with. Um, and, uh, and, and train these activities, and then try to see how well they recognized it. And they, uh, you know, they did work to kind of say, well, what if we, what if we, what if we trained it on the belt line, and then we tested it on the belt line, but also what if we trained it on the belt line, and then you in fact did, you know, put it in your, put it, you know, uh, put it on your wrist or um, put it on your shoulder. And the upshot was that it sort of more or less we were around 80%, which, um, you know, certainly, you know, not perfect, not not good enough for some applications, but, um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, more than good enough to do some. Uh, good background understanding of you know is this person sedentary? Does this person need another call? You know are we getting out for our you know 20 minutes uh, you know three times a week walk that that, that we're supposed to um, be having? So so from an application perspective, um, we're uh, pulling this together in a project called UbiFit, um, pun intended. Uh, the goal of saying well, you know one of the things we really want to do is. Um, influence people's fitness level. So what we're really trying to do is build a persuasive technology. We're actually trying to change people's behavior um, with our artifacts. <clears throat> and so the goal here was to take two technologies, in one case, the, the, the mobile activity detection. Um, but in the other case, um, we, you know, we, have, we have a cell phone, which has you know, really nice, high color um, displays. They're, they're potentially on all the time. And in our daily life, we look at them 10, 20, you know, 40 times a day. And so can we use this personal ambient display plus this activity inference to um, you know, change, the way people, um, change the way people act physically? So, so we did a, I don't have any information about this here, but we did a, um, oh, I should say, so this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the PI on, on this project, Sonny Consolvo. So, so we did a study um, last year 
uh, where we did something similar on the phones, but we just used an off-the-shelf pedometer, and we actually had people just enter their step counts. And what's interesting is people really care about the particular activities that are being monitored. When you measure someone, people compete to the metrics. And so uh, that system was actually social, where people exchanged um, their goals and, and, and were sort of cross-coaching each other. And, and we saw messages between people saying things like, oh, you know, I went up a hill yesterday, but I got the same number of steps. Don't do any hills, because you don't get any extra credit for it. Um, so, so it is potentially really important that um, we can influence behavior, but in the wrong direction. Um, so it is really important that we, um, that, that we try to give people um, credit for, uh, for what they're doing and, and call these out. So, um, so the, the, uh, the metaphor that we're using for, for the ambient display is, um, is a blooming garden. So this is like, this is a one week display and you know, you do, you know, you, you do a cardiovascular workout, you go for a walk, you go for another walk. Um, and uh, this is our, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be doing our first deployment of this shortly. This is our attempt to um, try to come up with something that is uh, attractive enough that you would give up some valuable screen real estate for it instead of your calendar, you know, like, like your smartphone probably does now. Um, it has to be something you can read and interpret, but at the same time, you know, a lot of people are going to see your cell phone screen, whether they're borrowing your phone or whether they're looking over your shoulder. So it also has to be um, abstract enough that you at least feel like your privacy is being preserved. The truth is we don't know whether we're successfully doing any of those. So that's, that's what this deployment's all about. Um, and then there are goals. So, you know, when you actually do get that last, um, uh, that last walk of this person does more than I do. Um, you know, that last walk, you know, we, we, we've got this notion of goal state. And the truth is we don't really know how important um, you know, that particular aspect of the system is. Um, but, uh, but this is, um, I would say, sort of the high level, um, uh, you know, pointy bit that we're, we're doing with that particular stack of uh, technologies. Now, uh, I ended the last project talking about WISP, which was really kind of the, the pretty forward looking, um, kind of out there part of that project. So, so I thought I'd do the same thing um, with this project where, uh, you know, we've really been talking about physical activities um, in the context of, of this behavioral monitoring. And there's actually completely different domains that we could be monitoring um, with, our, with our sensor device that, that are also potentially valuable in the health space. And, and so this researcher is moving um, beyond doing sense making with physical activities and actually looking at social activities. There's um, theory in the, no, there's actually data in the psychology literature that says that you can infer things like people's emotional state, how social they are, what the roles and relationships are with people without actually understanding what's being said. You actually don't need to do you know, the, the language parsing, that actually there are social signals that will determine it. Things like turn taking, things like um, you know, how loud they're speaking, what's the rate of interruptions, what's their body language. Um, so we're looking to retask um, the, the sensor platform as well as the, the sense making stack in order to, rather than measuring steps and sitting, to actually try to infer um, these types of cues uh, and, and social features uh, of conversation and, and try to um, infer these. Examples of um, health applications would be things that, that, that have um, social disorder to them, um, like turn taking is a huge issue with autism. So if there is a system that could, could you know, recognize and prompt. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm happy afterwards actually to, to talk more about this. I think this, this is exciting, obviously rife with privacy issues. Um, but, but those are things that historically we've tried to you know, embrace rather than choose applications that, that don't have them. Um, so, so the status of this project this is much more um, uh, in its early stages than the last project. We're starting a, a three-week trial of, of this UBFIT um, this quarter, and we're going to go for a whole three months during the summer, which is, I mean, if you've done these types of things, you know it's a relatively long uh, amount of time to have your, you know, your hot glue and chewing gum solution out there with everyday people using it. Um, we're also looking at some more fundamental um, issues around um, recall accuracy versus sampling frequency. So uh, when you deploy one of these systems, very often you actually need to train a user up on it. So it will ask them questions saying, gee, I just noticed something I haven't seen before. Can you tell me, was it this activity or was it that one? Because I want to refine my model. And, and there's an interesting question of how long can you afford to wait to ask them? When do people actually start to forget what they did for these everyday activities? If you got kicked by a horse, you'll remember that for a long time. But, but, but you know, everyday type activities um, fade in the background quickly. Yet, it may be a really bad time to ask. And you actually have a window. 10 minutes later, you may recognize you know, what we're calling a micro break. Oh, they're standing in an elevator now. Now's a perfect time to ask them. But is it, is, has, has too much time elapsed? And actually, what's the trade off for that? Um, so we've, re we've released an artifact um, 
that uh, basically lets you do uh, mobile phone surveys. So, so write up some simple uh, XML uh, for these Microsoft smartphones, and it will trigger either based on time or based on you know, all kinds of sensors, including things from the phone itself, your calendar, your email, phone calls in and out, or data from, from sensors, um, actually pop up a survey and actually ask you questions that you can record and get at later. And then we're implementing some of the low-level speech features to see if we can make any headway um, on, this, on the speech problem. This is a smaller project. This has four full-time people on it. So uh, I tried to think of um, challenges that I thought were sort of you know, thesis-sized or bigger that um, we're uh, either continuing to work on or are important and, and, and we just don't have the expertise for. Um, so one is managing power consumption. I mean, power really is the, it's the elephant in the corner of, of the living room. And you know, we're looking at WISP for power harvesting in one very particular domain, but, but, but it's an enormous issue. Your cell phones last 10 days now, but the reason they last is, is, is not because um, we've got better batteries, but, but really because we're just duty cycling them very, very carefully. And if you turn on, say for instance, Wi-Fi in a Wi-Fi phone, the phone's dead in like four hours. You turn on the GPS, it's dead in like six hours. Um, so power is a huge problem if, if we want these systems to really be used um, you know, all the time, every day. Uh, making these deployments simple is very hard. Anybody who's deployed a real system, it's a distributed system. It's, it's, it's 12 computers. And so from a complexity perspective, it has all the complexity of 12 computers. Um, scaling up learning. So if, if we are going to try to you know, learn over, over millions of models of everything we do, uh, I am assured that there are very hard scaling issues there. This, this thing, you know, these are clunky. And, and you know, the alternative, if the alternative is being put in an assisted living facility, I think people will tolerate this. But it's not a good excuse to not design for wearability. So, um, uh, we actually do no design in our lab, you know, as you can tell. Um, but, but, but I think this is a really interesting area. Obviously, privacy and security are, are enormous, enormous issues. Um, you know, when, when we talk about sensitive data, people say, oh, well, you know, if my, visa, if my visa bill got in other people's hands, well, forget about it. Compared to some of the data that, that the systems we're designing are, are intended to collect, you know, visa data would look very, very tame. I mean, we're talking about things that would potentially make you not eligible to get insurance or to get a job. And so you need to make sure these things are very carefully safeguarded and that you understand what you're doing. And then, and then finally, something that you know, uh, is very hard in research is actually measuring real world value um, of these applications. And so this is actually a research opportunity for how do you actually do studies of these um, nascent technologies um, out in the field. Uh, so, so here's a, a sort of cheesy summary slide. So you know, I am a firm believer that activity monitoring is a key enabler for future health systems. And um, I think one of the secret sauces for that is going to be the statistical um, reasoning. It's going to make its way into, into lots and lots of systems. And the dense sensing is, is probably where the data that these systems are going to um, work on is going to come from. Um, you know, our early results show uh, apparently breakthrough recognition rates um, for the things that we've looked at. But of course, you know, we have to do some, some large scale um, validation to, to actually show um, that this is going on. So there, see, I ended 10 minutes to spare. An excellent talk. I'm sure there are many questions in the floor, so please, uh, please uh, ask a question. I thought so. Nate Ota. Hi, uh, Nate Ota. Uh, I, I wonder if, if anyone in your group has thought about how uh, your systems for health may interact with systems for energy or entertainment that use similar technologies like wireless sensor networks. Yeah, so if by interact with you mean interact negatively with, we, we haven't thought about that. In, if what you're saying is there, fundamentally it's really the same thing, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't want to you know, oversimplify this, but you know, looking at the health of a human and looking at their, their, their network of people that care for them, this is not unlike you know, caring for any big complex mechanism. So actually, uh, the, the inference techniques from TLC um, we actually deployed them in a, it was a research fab, but it, in a fab, you know, these big complicated machines and actually trying to understand what are the best ways to actually maintain them and what objects are used. So, so, so absolutely. I'm not sure um, about um, entertainment. That one in particular I think we haven't thought about, but definitely in terms of workflow and, and, and um, home, home energy monitoring, we, we, we thought it's, it's clearly a great domain. I have uh, two questions. One of them was, uh, I was wondering what the unit cost is for your, uh, the, the second uh, moat that you, you showed with the, the beefed up processor, which you expect the unit cost to be eventually in, in volume production. And the second question was, uh, what are the, the biggest uh, challenges in uh, 
I don't know, I, I would feel very hard pressed to put something on me that monitors me, right? So I was just wondering what the biggest challenges are in convincing people to, to be monitored by technology. Great, good. I actually have good answers to both of those questions. So I know the answer to the first one. The, so so the, the, the Intel note with the Xscale processor um, was just um, was just picked up as a design by Crossbow last week. And I think they're going to sell for about $250. I was told the bomb cost, whatever that means. I, there are no bombs in it. It stands for something, obviously. Little, little Oh, there you go. I'm a software guy. Uh, it w it's about 80 bucks. So, so there's there's the answer to that. You'll be able to get them through crossbow. So the second question, which is you know carrying things that monitor, I, I absolutely agree. It's a very very scary thing. I mean the truth is you're already carrying devices that monitor. If you carry a cell phone, the cell provider knows where you're all the time, and if you go nuts and kidnap somebody and take them away, they're probably going to use your cell phone to find you, or they're going to use it to rescue you. Um, so what it really boils down to is, um, you know, the, the the value versus the potential risks. And so I think the answer is, you know. Be privacy preserving. Think about the whole chain of privacy from the device all the way up to the user experience. Mitigate risks um, at every opportunity, and then obviously you know, make the application as high a value as possible. That's Where's not a very good answer, actually. It, it seems like you're putting a lot of work into uh, modeling what the actions are based on the sensor data. So you have this, and you know, you're connecting that dot between this sequence of gyroscopic data equals walking upstairs. Is there any intention to or create a repository of those models and make that type of information available? You know, that, that's a good question. I mean, I know there are, uh, especially um, like Stephen and Tilly at, at, um, at, at MIT, they're actually starting to take the data sets and put them up to be sort of, you know, like, like the BSD file system traces and really try to make them something that the research community can unify around and, and compare results. Um, in terms of models, I've never seen any, um, I, I've never seen any, you know, external things saying, oh, here are a bunch of, you know, boosted stump things for measuring this. One problem is that it's extremely sensitive to the particular part. So, I mean, literally, you switch accelerometers, and you, and you have to actually sort of re retrain your models. I'm sure, you know, if anybody's done this and sw switched, switch, you know, the switch vendors for a particular part. I, I think there's actually a research challenge there in coming up with something sort of at the sensor driver level, so you could actually swap out parts. And if properly characterized, you could use an off-the-shelf model. But I think there's almost no reuse of models uh, largely for that reason. Just a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, a clarification of that second mode that you were talking about. Were you, did I hear you say that that was energy scavenged and didn't use any batteries? No. So the, so, so okay. no. The, the energy scavenged, uh, the energy scavenging we are doing with a completely custom system, and that's actually using an ultra low power microcontroller that was originally designed for being on a flash chip. So that one, absolutely not. There's okay, so, so that Saturn thing was actually, it had batteries in it. No, no, oh, no, sorry. Okay. It's just not a moat. I was being careful with the term moat. No, yeah, so that is a complete computer system with uh, a microcontroller, flash storage, um, and a 3D accelerometer, and it is entirely powered with energy that it's harvesting from the RFID reader. Okay, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's like in the nanovolts is what, you know, nanoamps. And the, the, the second sort of unrelated question is uh, you're also suggesting that the statistical learning and inference techniques kind of break down when you try to scale up. Is that correct? Or no, it's, the, it's that, the, is that the learning is just plain slow. It's that if you want to actually um, you know, crunch these models and you want to take, um, especially as the number of, of features that you can potentially detect go up, if you want to say, look, these are the 600 different things I can detect. And you know, the, here's some ground truth data for these thousands and thousands of activities. I mean, the things wind up blowing up. I mean, I don't know that they're exponential where the polynomial is, but um, just traditionally, you know, we're working with what are relatively large data sets. You know, a, you know, a year's worth of trace data, um, you know, from people one 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 week um, a month or 40,000 activities. But but there's still actually a lot more scaling to do, and and they're just very computationally intense. So there's some really interesting parallel computing um, challenges for you know students wanting to. End body problem and paralyze it, but 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 in this space and, and scale it up. Last couple of questions. You, you're obviously working in in human activity and, and the computing thereof, the modeling thereof, the communication thereof. I'm puzzled as to why you're restricting yourself to healthcare because I would have thought that all kinds of human activities, um, the military in particular, would be fascinated uh, by this. You know, is a pilot fit to pl fly? Is he, is he able to land his plane on the deck of the aircraft carrier, et cetera, et cetera? So it's a good question. So I would say we're definitely not restricting ourselves to health. I mean, we actually have um, 
you know, some application in personal robotics. Um, uh, we have some in, in, in social interaction. We have some, some in workflow. I mean, this was a talk about healthcare, but, but health really has been the grounding uh, motivation and, and domain for about 75% of our work. And that's just because it's a small lab and we've got really the three or four application focused people. That's really, that's really kind of where their interests are. But I agree, this does have wider applicability. Uh, one last question from anybody? If not, let's uh, thank our speaker for a wonderful talk. And thank you for coming.